Hi, I'm Vanessa and I love bad Star Trek. I will throw the baby shower for the unwanted pregnancy that is season two of Star Trek's Next Generation. Today, I will be talking to you about an episode called The Child, the season premiere of season two of The Next Generation. Considering what happened in the last season, the fact that this show was renewed is a miracle because we started at the bottom and we're still at the bottom. Da, da. This season is the shortest of the series because of a writer's strike. Indeed, the script for The Child was a dusted off oldie from a Star Trek spinoff that never aired in the late 70s called Star Trek Phase 2. So we can blame the strike for this episode sucking, but we can also say that they had 12 years to fix it. There are some promising elements to this episode. For example, we get introduced to the new chief medical officer, Dr. Pulaski, played by Diana Maldar. And an actress with miles of TV credits, who also appeared a couple times in the original series. I appreciated the dimension that she brought to a character that doesn't get a ton of screen time. She has a bit of Bones-type brusqueness and straightforward bedside manner that sets her apart from the doting and motherly crusher. Gates McFadden, who plays Beverly, however, does come back in season three. Worf gets promoted to a Lieutenant Junior Class security chief with a Klingon sash that thankfully looks a lot less like an Easter basket. And Geordi gets promoted to chief engineer. The show's original vision was for Geordi to be the blind pilot, but obviously LeVar Burton's talents called for more to do. And excitingly, we're also introduced to a new character, Guinan, the centuries-old bartender in a bar that doesn't serve alcohol. When she heard that there was going to be a new Star Trek show made, she asked LeVar to ask the writers to get her a part. Writers didn't believe that it was Whoopi, but Whoopi has a very personal connection with Star Trek, as she was inspired by seeing Ahura on the original series, who, quote, didn't serve coffee but was in charge of communications, and there was no other sci-fi show that had black people in the future. And and she wanted the opportunity to inspire others as Ahura inspired her. So as we can see, representation absolutely matters. And Wesley is back sans his mother, but the biggest change of all is on the follicular front. Welcome to the stage. Cookie Duster! The actor Jonathan Frakes grew the beard because he was just legitimately tired of shaving. Frakes said the executives originally told him to shave off 18% of the beard because each of the executives apparently had a different number and that was the average. What does that mean? Is he meant to shave stripes in there? Sell ad space? What does that mean? <laughs> so you might be asking, what is this episode about? And I'll tell you, none of the changes that I just mentioned. Uh, like they weave in Wesley being convinced to stay on the Enterprise because he had a brief conversation with Guinan. So I've come up with an alternative plot because I hate this episode. <laughs> so an unknown force infiltrates the Enterprise and systems are shutting down left and right and people are dying and stuff. And Jordy figures out that the only thing that'll save the ship is if Riker grows a beard. Riker is reluctant to let his facial pubes reach their full potential. So Picard enlists the one person he knows that will change Riker's mind, Guinan, who convinces him with some pithy witticisms and sage wisdom. Meanwhile, the Ferengi open fire on the ship, but Worf, a master tactician, outmaneuvers them without even using warp speed. Pulaski comes up with a formula that hastens the beard's growth, and Wesley gets permission from his mom to stay on the Enterprise. That that doesn't change. Like, it, I don't think that needed to be a subplot either, that it just happens. So anyway, Jordy and Worf are promoted, Guinan is asked to stay, and, but no. No, we don't get my French vanilla fantasy as a season two premiere. We get a, a twinkle of light comes aboard the Enterprise from outside the ship and travels through some guy's quarters who is sporting some chest hair that I can only describe as upsetting and into Deanna Troy's quarters. So she basically gets assaulted by a Christmas light. Um, does it even take a writer to know that this is horrible? The next morning, because what is even morning in space, Picard checks in with Pulaski, who he finds out is not in sick bay, but at the bar, 10 forward. So he gets a bee in his bonnet. 
not the best way to meet your new captain. And that's how we're introduced to that part of the ship, which also just appeared like magically. Anyway, Troy and Pulaski are there, Troy looking very shaken, wanting to talk to Picard. And there's a beat where Pulaski asks Picard to sit, overriding his authority of the situation. Doctor, protocol may have been lax on your last assignment, but here on the Enterprise... Sit down, Captain. You'd better listen to this. That, I think, is a smart way to introduce the character. She doesn't give a shit about formality or rank. So this is where we find out that Troy is pregnant. Why we find out in 10 Forward is confusing. Did she pee on a stick in the 10 Forward bathroom while looking on Yahoo Answers for the answer to how is Babby formed? Wouldn't it make more sense for Troy to be in sick bay awaiting the results of tests? But we had to have Pulaski start off on the wrong foot, so here we go. And this prompts a meeting with the bridge crew on the observation deck where the baby announcement is made. Riker does not take this well, presumably because of the history he and Troy have. So he makes some demands and wants some answers. Counselor Deanna Troy is pregnant. This is a surprise. Now, understand, we believe that conception took place 11 hours ago. What? It gets better. I don't mean to be indelicate, but who's the father? I don't buy Riker being a misogynist to this degree, so this for me is hard to watch. And Troy is silently in the corner looking like a teenager who has done something wrong. Last night, while I slept, Something which I can only describe as a presence entered my body. While Pulaski explains that the pregnancy is advancing with freakish speed and that the fetus is already at the end of the first trimester and Troy would give birth within 36 hours. When Troy speaks up and says that she's keeping the baby after everyone debates what to do next with the unborn after assuming that she would abort it, there's a clear indication that this is a very pro-life episode. How did we get here? Why was this made? This is a script that has gone through several rewrites, mind you. Originally, it was about some crew member getting pregnant with evil alien eggs. A vestige of that is evident through a comment Worf makes about the baby being a danger to the ship after being born, even though they confirmed that, like Troy, it's just a betazoid human hybrid and not a chest burster. My favorite scene in this is the birth scene because Data is Troy's birthing partner, so he asks a ton of questions. The child inside you, are you able to access his thought process? Does he have thoughts? You are aware of him. Is he aware of you? When does that awareness begin? It's happening. Since Worf's still convinced that this kid's gonna be a security risk, he brings his whole team in there. You know, it's a party in Troy's pants and everyone is coming. <laughs> By the time Picard visits the new baby the next day, he's rapidly become about four years old. Ian, say hello to Captain Picard. You mean he can talk? Hello. If anyone hasn't picked up on it yet, this episode is an explicit endorsement of a very pro-life stance from her painless assault resulting in conception to her unambiguous declaration of keeping the baby whose effects on her body and future are truly up in the air as it was just an educated guess about what was going to happen. Pulaski seems suspiciously certain about the health of both the fetus and the pregnancy. Even if it was an alien baby, to her breeze of a pregnancy, to the lack of trauma during and after the kid's birth, to the lack of postpartum depression, to the entirely obedient child capable only of being completely adorable, even playing with some puppies in one scene. There's no mention of the violation that is assault, the emotional and physical complications that come with pregnancy as well as delivery, or what being a mother does to the world's expectations of women, particularly single mothers who are 
absolutely not a protected class, but that would have made it so that the uterus owner's feelings were taken into account. A child's financial future in the present day is not as guaranteed as it is in the Federation. And, and I would have appreciated any line mentioning how lucky that kid is to not have to worry. They wrap up the episode by creating this scenario where the ship is in danger because the Enterprise is carrying some volatile substance and the containment system designed to keep it in line is completely coming apart. Captain, we have a, a malfunction in the containment area. How serious? Very. Turns out that the reason that there's danger is because of the kid, because he's radioactive and stuff. So he turns back into a light and leaves, and Troy is basically left to mourn a kid who never gets mentioned again, and everything's back to normal. Traumatizing women on the ship seems to be something that gives the creators of this series an itchy trigger finger. Yes, I too would like it if a pregnancy lasted two days and the kid within a week would be middle-aged and already in therapy and dead because of natural causes by the end of the month. Just get it all over with. But that's the insidious message of this episode, that it's unencumbered joy and fulfillment that results from keeping a baby to term, even if it was the product of assault, no matter how long it lives, because it could be an alien testing our moral and uterine resolve. It's insulting to me to introduce two strong women characters only to have another woman's emotional reality completely undermined. Moral of the story, pay your goddamn writers. Or objectively watch a Christmas light creep up a main character's leg and realize the mistake that you're very obviously making. This just made me mad, and unfortunately it's not the last time that someone on the Enterprise is encouraged to carry an alien baby to term. Trip on Enterprise also did so on an episode called Unexpected. Because, but it was more of a silly thing because cis guy getting pregnant LULs but it just had a more comical bent because they took the time to consider Tripp's feelings, sort of like that movie Junior that came out a long time ago. Tripp even wants the fetus removed, but can't because biology and they don't want to kill the fetus. So in a way, it's even more explicitly pro-life. And amazingly, that episode somehow managed to be more entertaining than the child because both are pro-life propaganda, but the added variable of assault pushes the child into to dangerous for women territory. Why didn't the twinkly thing go into the guy's out of control chest hair in the beginning? He, the guy would have shaved it immediately, seeing that this twinkly thing was making a nest. And Riker would have picked it up and stuck it on his face, and that would have been the origin story for his beard, where Riker plays a hairy seahorse. The child is just full on offensive. That's all. I hate it. Till next time, I guess.